my name is Belinda Orlin. I'm the Senior Manager of Research Operations at the American Heart Association. And this webinar is co-sponsored by the Health Research Alliance and the Center for Open Science. The Health Research Alliance is a membership organization of almost 80 um, nonprofit and non-governmental funders whose mission is to maximize the impact of biomedical and improve human health. The Center for Open Science um, is a nonprofit and technology and advocacy organization that's dedicated to improving research practices, increasing openness, integrity, and reproducibility in research, and accelerating discovery. I think we have some slides that they're going to put up that talk a little bit more about the HRA, if someone could advance those. Does that look good? That looks great. So this slide is showing the diversity of our HRA membership in both size and mission. One of the strategies that the HRA uses is to enhance the impact of our research funding through eight working groups. So one of those eight working groups is the Open Science Task Force. And um, um, oh, I, along with Jason Gerson from PCORI, are currently the co-chairs for this Open Science Task Force. At our recent HRA meeting, we had a breakout session for this group. And there was a lot of interest around pre-registration, and that was a topic that we really wanted to get some more information out about for our group. So HRA has partnered with Center for Open Science uh, many times before, including co-hosting a forum for funders to discuss how to maximize research impact by promoting open and reproducible research, um, offering a webinar on the top guidelines to the funder community. And today, we're looking forward to hearing from Brian Nosek, which I believe Brian is... Um, snowbound in, um, in Virginia. So hopefully we'll have a good connection here. And Brian is the Center for Open Sciences Executive Director. Um, and he's gonna talk to us a little bit about, about how pre-registering pre research can improve research rigor and reduce, Brian, and reduce bias, sorry. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Brian. Great, thank you, Belinda. And thanks everyone for making time for this today. Uh, a couple of uh, general notes before uh, we get going into the presentation. Uh, the first is that uh, there is a Q&A feature uh, that should, you should be able to see in your uh, Zoom uh, browser. If you click that, you can ask questions uh, at any time uh, during the presentation. Most likely, uh, those will be addressed uh, as we get to the end. We should have plenty of time uh, for uh, Q&A uh, back and forth. Uh, but they will be addressed either by myself or uh, another member of the team. A second note, as Belinda uh, mentioned, is uh, if you are like me and joined the winter uh, that was foisted upon us over the last two days, you are stuck at home. Uh, so the, there is two disasters that could occur. Uh, one is that uh, I will lose internet connection, uh, but my voice is all by phone, uh, so I should be able to continue that. Uh, and then we have backup at the office uh, of folks that are, uh, can manage the slides. Uh, and the second possibility is that uh, one of two children will come rushing in behind me, uh, declaring that I need to exert retribution on the other one for the misbehavior. Uh, they know they're not supposed to come in, uh, but who knows what will happen. So avoiding those two disasters, if we can get through this with plain uh, discussion, great. So uh, I will jump in. Uh, what I hope to do here uh, is give 35, 40 uh, minutes of overview uh, of what pre-registration is, why it's important, uh, and how it can be implemented in effective ways uh, to facilitate uh, improving rigor and reproducibility of research. Uh, Pre-registration is a very popular topic uh, these days, and increasingly so as it's gaining awareness and traction outside of its most prominent application, and that is in uh, clinical trials work, uh, where it has been uh, required uh, by law since 2000. Uh, so the, uh, the context for this is really in trying to think about how is it that we can maximize uh, the quality uh, of our research uh, and advance in, uh, knowledge, cures, and solutions as quickly and effectively as possible. So in the big picture, the goal for, for, for in general, uh, for what kind of work we are trying to do and the research community is trying to do is, is advance transparency, rigor, and reproducibility in order to maximize the return on our research investments. There's only so many dollars uh, to, that can be dedicated uh, to trying to solve the problems that we're trying to solve. And we want those dollars and that time to be as effective and efficient as possible in making discoveries 
advancing knowledge and uh, creating the cures and solutions that we seek. Peer registration of the many different things that one can do, increasing uh, open, having open data, uh, sharing materials, uh, open review, many different practices for promoting greater transparency and rigor. Pre-registration is probably the most behave, uh, most important among them, uh, particularly on advancing rigor and the credibility of the findings uh, that we observe. And so what I want to do today is make the case for that. Why is it, how is it uh, that pre-registration uh, plays such a fund can play such a fundamental role in improving the rigor of our research? And so that's what I will uh, try to review. And so what I'll start with here is 10 to 15 minutes of just trying to outline what the problem is uh, that pre-registration is relevant for solving, and then how it is pre-registration helps to address that. And a nice sort of simplistic, almost caricature version uh, to sort of characterize the problem was advanced uh, by Samin Vizier, and I uh, provide a, a variation of the, the way that she spelled out these challenges that pre-registration addresses. So you can think of, the research process in this simplistic way, right? I come up with some kind of idea that I want to test to investigate an interesting question. There's some domain, some phenomenon, some area of interest that I am trying to uh, learn something about. And so I generate a study design. I, I have some question that I want to test. Maybe I have a clear hypothesis. Maybe I just sort of have a general set of questions. Uh, but maybe I have some predictions of what I think we'll observe based on our current understanding of what the world is. So the first thing that I do once I have the, the data outcome from that is observe. Did I, did I obtain the predictive effect? Right. And in a simplistic sense, if I did, I found what I was looking for, then what do I do? Go to publication, right? Let's share that result with the world because I've discovered something uh, that I think is important enough to have studied and I wanna share it with others. If I didn't obtain the effects that I observed, my interest in that study doesn't disappear instantly. I still may have things that I could learn uh, from that data that I now observed. And so I can then look at the data and say, did I find anything that's interesting? Sure, it wasn't exactly what I anticipated up front, or maybe I didn't have strong expectations. Did I find something? And if I do find something, then one possible path uh, for sharing that information is to then construct a story. Well, I didn't anticipate this in advance, but now that I've observed the data, I come up with an explanation. Oh, I can understand how it is that this works or why it might have come out this way. Uh, I can might reference old theories. I might sort of fashion a, a narrative that sort of puts the story points together. Uh, and then I publish that. Here is what I think I've learned based on the discoveries that I didn't anticipate, but that sort of emerged uh, from the data. Now, the challenge part of that uh, is what is commonly known as harking, hypothesizing after the results are known. So if I generate my, my answers, why it is I observed that post facto, uh, then I am not doing a prediction, I'm doing a post diction, I'm explaining after the fact. But it's also possible that even after sort of looking around at the different things that emerged, I don't see anything right away, I still may not be done with this data set. I really still think that there's more to do. But just first to point out what I mean uh, by uh, another way that people have analogized uh, harking, uh, is the Texas sharpshooter fallacy, right? So the, 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 this basic fallacy is there's a sharpshooter, he points his gun at the uh, wall, he takes some shots, and then afterwards, he goes and draws the bullseyes around where he hit the wall and says, see, I'm a great shot. Uh, the obvious point is, if you put the target in advance, that's a prediction. That's where I have to aim, and if I hit there, then I will treat that shot as a credible result of his skills. But if I construct the targets after the fact and say, well, that's what I was aiming, that's the explanation, then the results are not that uh, credible. Okay. Uh, so the, the, but if it is the case that I even want to go further, I don't find anything that's interesting just observing uh, the outcomes, I may then look into the data set, start to pull it apart in different ways. So this may be a place where there's a number of outliers. Oh, what happens if I change uh, what my criterion is for including uh, observations in my analysis versus exclude them. What happens if I put a different functional form on the analysis? What happens if I include some covariates? Maybe if I collected a little bit more data, uh, just a little bit more, the effects would be clearer. So that 
kind of process is commonly known as p-hacking uh, or uh, taking advantage of researcher degrees of freedom uh, or more generally questionable research practices where I may do behaviors uh, that helped me to sort of see signal, but it may be signal that's leveraging chance, taking advantage of noise by looking for significant positive results uh, when there aren't actually any there. And if I publish those, they may actually lose a lot of, they may be non-credible results because I have leveraged chance for trying to observe things. Uh, but nevertheless, because I can construct interesting findings, uh, they may be publishable because people say, oh, that, that is interesting. I, and they don't know the original, the origin history of how it is I got to those claims. If I don't find anything even in that, then this is a dead study, right? I did, it's all negative results, nothing interesting here, so drop it into the file drawer. And the main problem that emerges there is this potential for selective reporting. That as a practicing researcher, I'm incentivized to publish. I try to publish as much as I can in the things that I'm learning. I also am more interested in finding positive results and novel findings that haven't been observed before because those things are more interesting. But as a consequence, I may be more likely to ignore the null results, the things that come out negative, the things that didn't quite work. And if I'm taking advantage of chance in this decision to process along the way, if I'm searching for findings uh, among what it is I observed, if I'm reanalyzing the data and findings are popping out, I may be obtaining positive results that are an exaggeration of reality compared to what actually happens. And so if I practice selective reporting, I promote positive results into publication and reviewers are more likely perhaps to accepts positive results as more interesting and innovative and uh, useful for the literature. And the file drawer uh, may be more replete with negative results. And as a consequence, the published literature is, appears to be more positive, more significant, more innovative than the reality is in the data. Okay, so that's the sort of basic matrix of what the challenges are, harking, p-hacking, and selective reporting that are ultimately particularly relevant uh, for the role of pre-registration. So let me just give a couple of very quick examples uh, of uh, data findings that suggest that some of these issues are real and significant challenges in the published literature. And one of them is about the power of research designs. So there are a number of studies that have investigated the power of studies to detect the findings uh, that they're investigating. And the, across these many different studies across many domains, the average power of studies tends to fall between 20 and 50%. What does that mean? Uh, the power of a study is uh, indicating if the effect size that we think, if the size of this effect is what we think it is, and the sample size that we have for investigating that question is what we define, then the power is the likelihood that we would find a significant result, a positive effect of that effect size. So to put this in more concrete terms, if I am doing studies that have an average power of 50%, but I'm studying all true things, the effect size I think is going to occur is the true effect size, there really is an effect, uh, and my power is about 50%, then what I would expect is that about half of my studies would find positive evidence for that effect, and half of the studies would find negative evidence, even though it's a true effect. So because of that, the average power of studies is a ceiling on what we would expect the positive result rate in the literature to be. So if we assume that the entire literature is true findings that are uh, studying the effects that they study, then what we would expect, given that the average power is 20 to 50 percent, is that the average, the average study, there's about 20 to 50 percent of the studies would find positive results. But in fact, when we look at the positive result rate in the published literature across a variety of different uh, disciplines, it tends to be 90 percent or higher showing positive results. So these two numbers do not line up. It's not possible uh, that we could have 90 percent positive result rate almost every study that's published finding positive results, while simultaneously those studies have an average power of 50% at best. And that's the most generous possibility because it, isn't, it surely isn't the case that every single thing that we have studied uh, is uh, a true effect 
uh, and, and at the effect size that we believe it is. So what this implies very strongly is that something, something big is getting left out, that we are getting into the published literature those studies that happen to meet the significance threshold, and so they're showing positive results. And a lot of negative results or underpowered studies uh, are getting left aside, are not getting into the literature. Okay, so that's one example. A second example comes from Annie Franco and her colleagues, where they wanted to see what happens to, in comparison of what the study was when it was actually done, and what was reported in the paper uh, when it's finally reported. And what I'm showing you here is a plot where they compared what was in a study from a sample of uh, studies that they were able to get versus what was reported in the paper about that study. And on the x-axis, where it's number of outcomes administered, that is, in the actual experiment, how many outcome measures did they have from zero uh, up to 40? On the y-axis uh, is the number of outcomes reported, which means in the paper, how many outcomes did they report were in the experiment? Uh, so again, from zero to 40. So what you would expect if the researchers reported every outcome that they measured in the study is that all of the dots, which indicate individual studies, would be on the diagonal line, indicating that they, they, ran, they had five outcome measures, they reported five outcome measures. But what you see is that there are many of those uh, dots, in fact, 70% or so of those dots fall below the line, indicating that the paper reported fewer of the outcome measures that were included in the study. So that itself is selective reporting, right? For some reason, the authors or the reviewers uh, and editors said exclude, decided to exclude some of the information that was in the study. Some outcome measures weren't reported. But there's an additional thing that they did in follow-up, and that is to look at the outcomes because they were, had access to the data in this case. So they looked at the outcomes that were reported versus the outcomes that were not reported. And what they observed is that for the outcomes that were reported, there were 122 total outcomes. The median p-value uh, was 0.02. Now, if you know about p-values, a, a significant p-value is p less than 0.05. So you want smaller p-values indicating that this data is unusual in some way. If there was no effect to observe, then this was unlikely to have occurred, and so a smaller value indicates greater unlikelihood. So something might, we might be detecting something here. Uh, the median effect size, about 0.29, is about, about a third of a standard deviation between uh, what the treatment group was observed versus the control group in experimental design. And the number of the findings uh, that achieved this P less than 0.05, the traditional marker for significant effect, was 63%. Compare that to the unreported tests. There, there are 147, and the median p-value for these, the ones that didn't get into the paper, was 0.35. So median was, these were no effects. The average effect size was less than half, 0.13 of the reported tests and only 23% of the unreported tests uh, were significant effects. So this is demonstrating that bias uh, in selective reporting, that some of the tests, even in the same experiment, weren't getting mentioned at all, and those that weren't getting mentioned were more likely to be ones that didn't find positive results. The negative results were the ones that were left out, uh, for whatever reason in whatever part of the pipeline that it occurred. So this is part of that challenge of there is a history from what the study was to what's ultimately reported. And as readers of those reports, we don't know that history. We can't evaluate credibly the research as reported in the paper because we don't necessarily know the entire history of what the experiment actually was and what the decision process was for how to analyze the data and which outcomes to report and which outcomes not to report. And so that provides a significant unknown to evaluating the credibility of that ultimate finding. Okay, so that's as much as I'm gonna say about the problems. There's many other areas where we could discuss challenges uh, about the research process. But what I wanna do now is transition into talking about the context in which pre-registration emerges as a solution. And the context for that 
is thinking about the sort of two modes of the research process as it occurs uh, in practice. And philosophers of science have talked about these two modes of research in a variety of different ways. One of them is this context of justification versus the context of discovery. And so when we are, let me talk about each of these in turn, right? So when we're in the context of justification, what I am doing when I start a research project is I'm looking for data that I can use to confront my current understanding of the world. So I have some hypothesis about how this phenomenon works. And so I wanna acquire data in order to test that hypothesis. Can I confirm or disconfirm uh, whether this hypothesis holds when I obtain data to uh, evaluate it? So, my, th so this is hypothesis testing, right? I have existing models of the world that I know are incomplete in some way, but I wanna confront them to see which parts of it survive, which ones don't. Uh, so then I can advance to the next set of questions. So the decisions that I make about how to evaluate that hypothesis are independent of the data. I haven't observed the data yet when I'm in the context of justification because the data are the tests against which my hypotheses, my beliefs about what will happen in the world will be confronted. So this is true prediction uh, kinds of uh, uh, context for doing research. The other mode of research, the context of discovery, what I'm doing in that context with data is actually interacting with the data in order to generate ideas about how the world works. I don't have necessarily a model or I already recognize the inefficiencies of my model about the world. And so I'm generating hypotheses by looking at the data and finding different ways that I might understand, discover new things that I hadn't anticipated at all. So this is exploratory research. I am making decisions that are contingent on the data. As I observe the data, it influences how I then look at the data next, what other analyses that I do. So this kind of process, the exploration and discovery is very productive part of research because our existing models of the world are very incomplete, especially when we're in preclinical or basic domains, we don't yet have in many cases, real clear expectations about how a particular phenomenon works. We're really starting with a very open-ended mindset about let's look at many different possibilities and the data will inform us uh, on how it is we might think about the phenomenon so that we can start to put together some kind of theoretical framework to understand what it is and how it works. So this is really important but uh, there is a very important difference between exploratory analysis and how we treat it versus confirmatory analysis and how we treat it. Uh, and a key part of that is that the ways that we ordinarily use statistical inference, for example, those p-values that we discussed earlier, they are for the context of justification. We design studies, we evaluate those uh, findings with statistical inference when we are hypothesis testing. It's called null hypothesis significance testing, right? So this is the domain in which p-values are interpretable. And the reason that they're interpretable in the context of confirmation is that the p-values are estimates of unlikelihood. But in order for them to be diagnostic estimates of unlikelihood, we need to know how many tests were done and how those tests were planned for those p-values to retain their diagnosticity. So if I know that this is the one test I'm going to do and I evaluate this test, then that p-value of 0.02 provides a probabilistic indication that this was observed, this data, this extreme or more was observed by chance versus not. But if there were many possible analyses that I could have done, then I don't know how to adjust that p-value's diagnosticity uh, for making accurate inference, because now there are multiple tests that make it the unlikelihood uncertain. And so in data exploration mode, when I'm generating hypotheses and my decisions are influenced by the data as I look at it, the p-values lose their diagnosticity. A small p-value is no longer much information that this was unlikely, because I've looked at many different p-values, and the choices of how I interacted with the data were influenced by what it was I observed in the p-values and the effect sizes and the distributions, et cetera. And so I'm much more likely to leverage chance uh, and leverage noise and inadvertently interpret it as signal. So the consequence of that is that data, 
findings that are outcomes of exploratory analysis are necessarily more uncertain in terms of uh, the confidence or credibility that we can uh, claim of them compared to ones that are done in a strong confirmatory framework. And that's totally okay because that's part of what exploration is, is we sort of discover what's possible and then we design studies to evaluate what's credible with confirmatory tests. And the real consequence that we confront if, if these two both very important modes of analysis is that if we present exploratory analyses as confirmatory, we may increase their publishability because we're more likely to find effects that are positive effects or novel findings that look like they have low p-values if we're still using those statistical inferences, but at the consequence of loss of credibility of those results. They're less likely to be reproducible results because we're more likely to leverage champs and generate false positives and exaggerations uh, of cr credible findings. So this is where pre-registration comes in because the role of pre-registration is a singular function. And that is to make it clear when one is in the context of justification versus the context of discovery. We need both of these modes of analysis and investigation, but pre-registration helps to clarify when we're doing one versus the other, because with the pre-registration, we commit in advance. Before we've observed the outcomes in the data, we commit to how it is we're going to analyze that data and what it is we're going to report. And so we can count the number of statistical analyses that we're going to do, and we can adjust our, our p-values in order to have those retain strong diagnosticity uh, for interpretation at the end. And then everything else we do, once we observe the data, crosses that uh, confirmatory barrier and is in some degree of exploration. I'm treating this as dichotomous here. It is more complicated uh, than that. There is some co continuous uh, nature of this, and we can talk about that more later. Uh, but once it is past what it is we've registered and committed to before observing the data, then the p-values start to lose diagnosticity until they're not very useful at all. Okay, so that is uh, the context of uh, what the role of pre-registration is uh, in terms of distinguishing confirmatory and exploratory analysis. Let me return uh, to this little matrix we started with uh, that Samin had uh, generated uh, and clarify how it is that, that those modes of analysis are imposed onto this. Those first initial steps are where we are in confirmatory research. We have a question, we have a reason that we're doing the study, uh, and we have some kind of plan. It may be minimal plan, but we have some, almost always, we we'll have some kind of plan for how it is we're going to look at that data and interpret it. Uh, that really can be minimal because many times we enter a study with very exploratory mindset already at the outset. We have very few expectations. But if we have no plan at all, it's unlikely that we would do a study. So at least we will often have uh, some kind of plan that has a minimal confirmatory test. But everything else that we do after we observe those things that we've predicted in advance is the exploratory analysis. The, what we call harking and p-hacking are problematic only to the extent that they are treated as confirmatory tests that we treat the statistical inferences that we make out of them as credible indicators of, uh, for uh, interpretation, as if it came from hypothesis testing. If instead we treat it as exploratory, we don't bother reporting p-values. We talk about the uncertainty. We, we surface that, in fact, these came out of exploratory analysis that needs to be followed up with a credible, uh, with a confirmatory analysis for greater credibility then we are more likely representing the data and the uncertainty in it uh, more responsibly. So to just point out an example of how important it is uh, to make this distinction very clear, uh, here is an example study from Bob Kaplan, Veronica Irvin. Uh, this is a, a study where they uh, examined uh, the outcomes of clinical trials from uh, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute where they were interested in part in what happened as a consequence of requiring pre-registration for clinical trials. And so the key outcome uh, to point out in this study is that uh, prior uh, to uh, clinical trials being required to be registered, you have to commit to what your primary outcome variable is uh, for this particular trial. 
the positive result rate in the sample of studies that they examined was 57%. 57% of studies in this particular sample showed positive results when they didn't have to commit in advance what the primary outcome was. Once pre-registration was acquired and they had to commit to what was the primary outcome, only 8% of the studies showed a positive result in this sample. That is a dramatic change that is associated with the change to pre-registration. Now, there's a couple of cautions with this particular example. Uh, one is that uh, they're, they're, it's a small sample. Uh, so it's possible that we observed this by chance in this small sample, even though it was uh, highly uh, unusual uh, change. Uh, so it does, like any other finding, need to be replicated. And I know that they are working on this further. Uh, a second caution is that it's not an actual experiment. People weren't randomized to do their study before or after clinical trials uh, was imposed. So it's certainly possible, even in this study, that, for example, in this uh, area of research, they just ran out of things to discover uh, after 2000. And so you didn't see positive results afterwards because there weren't more things to find. Now, that may not be super plausible, but it is possible. And so we have to identify those kinds of cautions. But this uh, is one example of many that find uh, that the role of pre-registration of providing some constraint uh, can increase the likelihood uh, of obtaining negative results where we would have otherwise potentially observed positive results. But also, theoretically at least, we presume that those are the more credible uh, outcomes. Okay, so one question that we, in, in presenting this with researchers, one question that I often sort of use is people look at the evidence uh, from even in clinical trials, there being outcome switching and some of these reductions uh, in positive effects, is to ask, are, are you, would I be okay uh, with receiving treatment based on clinical trials that were not pre-registered? Is it okay that researchers might uh, switch outcomes after the fact, that they might publish the positive results and not publish uh, the negative results, and a lot of that happened without even them intending to, right? I am not intending to find false results, but I'm human. I have lots of reasoning biases that might influence how it is I interpret the data. And because I have skin in the game, right, I need to get positive results in order to advance my career, I may be more likely to promote the positive results at reason, rationalize that those are the right ways to analyze the data, those are the right findings, and not report as much of the negative results because they're not so interesting. I reason that they might be the wrong way to do it. So most people, when they're asked this question in my experience, say, no, I'm really glad that clinical trials uh, are pre-registered. That's an important constraint to impose because those have uh, significant implications uh, for my health, uh, the community's health. So an obvious question is, why wouldn't we then have that same expectation for rigor or preclinical or basic research. And an argument that sometimes comes out before people think about it is, well, clinical trials are important. Ooh. If we're willing to go down that road, <laughs> that clinical trials are more important and our basic questions are less important, then we shouldn't complain uh, when funders decide not to fund our research as much anymore because it's not so important. I don't think that's the right answer. I think the harder answers uh, are ones that we can unpack, which is pragmatically, how do we think about the role of pre-registration in basic and preclinical sciences, particularly where there is a lot more exploration and confirmatory testing happening. And it's not always clear when we're in one mode or another. And so that's where I think the interesting challenges are for how it is we think about adoption of pre-registration in research. Okay. Uh, so let me summarize where it is, I think, what answers pre-registration offers for the kinds of problems that we're trying to address in science uh, and then get into some of these pragmatic issues. So pre-registration solves two things. First is selective reporting via the registering of studies. So one action is the registration of the study, that the study exists. So by registering that the study exists, I make it possible for you to know whether I'm reporting in my papers all the studies that I've conducted or a subset of the studies, because you can look at what studies has my laboratory registered and compare that to what studies are appearing in the paper. And just that action, thinking nothing of the analyses in them, just knowing what research was done, provides an ability to address selective reporting. 
So you know I do lots of research on question this particular question. So I am going to report only a subset of those studies because there's a lot of research that goes nowhere, that isn't very productive, there are errors, there are lots of things that happen. But it should be possible for you uh, to discover what those are so that you can evaluate whether you would have made the same decisions about ignoring some of that research or not, as I did. And so the registration of the study, that it exists, helps to make sure that all the research is discoverable. Uh, and, and then the peer review and decision process for what gets published is a filtering process uh, that we can evaluate uh, based on what's registered versus what's recorded. So that's problem one that it solves. The problem two that it solves is addressing this problem between confirmatory and confusing confirmatory versus exploratory analysis. So by pre-registering the analysis plan, how it is I'm going to analyze the data. So study exists, address selective reporting, pre-registering the analysis plan addresses all of the things that may happen and how it is I treat that data and then ultimately report that data uh, in the paper itself. So those two features of pre-registration have a profound impact on those three challenges uh, that we started with, harking, p-hacking, and selective reporting, or the file drawer effect. So ultimately, pre-registration uh, is important uh, because it helps to clarify between confirmatory and exploratory research, and both of them are critical for research prog process, uh, progress. Okay, so that's it for the big picture uh, of what the problem is and how pre-registration conceptually tries to solve that. So what I want to do now is describe what pre-registration in practice, if we say, okay, I'm ready to require for my grantees or encourage uh, my grantees to register their studies, what am I actually asking them to do? Uh, and then what are the barriers? What are the common objections that come up and how do we start to think about and talk about those uh, for registration? So concretely, what pre-registration is, is before observing the outcomes of the research, write down what the study design is, how it is that I did the study, what the methodology is, what the materials are, all of the features of the design, and how I plan to analyze the data. What is it that I'm going to do with that data in order to draw some inference about what it is I learned uh, from doing this study? That's step one. Step two is post that information to an independent repository. And that, in, or that registry then provides a date and timestamp. It might ask me to confirm, have you observed the outcomes yet or not? And so I is presuming that I'm not willing to commit fraud, that I'm going to answer honestly, no, I haven't, or yes, I did, but here's the, what I have observed, here's what I haven't. Uh, then that's in the registry uh, with time and date stamp for what it is is going to happen. So now it's, it has an independent check from me. Then. I, once I have the data, or if I already have it, once I unseal it, then I analyze the data following the plan that I just laid out in advance. I report all of those analyses. So if I propose to do 100 different analyses of that data set, and I only report four or five of them, the ones that look the most interesting, then I'm not actually following through with pre-registration. In order to follow through with pre-registration, I have to report all 100 that I plan. And so maybe if I thought about it in advance, I'd say, well, maybe I shouldn't have said I was going to analyze it 100 ways. Uh, maybe I'll report the five main ways, and then I can do other things as exploratory analysis. But once I finish reporting those, make sure that I report all of the analyses that I plan to do, then I explore the data set in lots of different ways. Uh, I, and I look at the data set to see what I can extract from it, what new things might I learn from it that might inspire the next thing uh, that I study. Uh, and if I want to talk about those findings from it, I certainly can do so, and I often do so, but I try to make now clear that these are the things that were not part of the analysis plan, the confirmatory test, but rather the exploratory things that I did after the fact. Okay, so that's what we are asking people for uh, when they are going to pre-register a study. So the first thing that happens in many, many cases when this is a new thing for researchers to consider is they, identify practical challenges uh, that are real and consequential for them importing pre-registration into their own research process. This is, these are important because pre-registration is not only the most important thing that we might be able to do to increase research credibility, but it's also the biggest ask. 
it is a change in the researcher's workflow. This idea of documenting this beforehand, the planning process, but the formalizing of that planning process is unusual for many researcher workflows. And so asking researchers to take this on requires a lot of mindset shift of how it is we think about the design and the execution of our experiments. And it confronts a lot of realities where the simple case, where I run studies very quickly, it's easy for me to collect data, uh, and I have a very uh, simple way of describing how it is I set up my studies and analyze my studies. It's easy to imagine pre-registration in that context. But that is only a limited context, a limited set of how it is that experiments uh, and research gets done. Sometimes research is done on very, very large data sets. Sometimes those data sets emerge over a long, long period of time. Uh, sometimes there are lots of issues of planning that are difficult uh, to address. And so it's very important for pre-registration to be adopted broadly is to consider how is it that we can apply the concepts of pre-registration against the challenges that are inevitably confronted in complicated, complex research uh, paradigms. So here are some of the big ones uh, that come up in researchers starting to think about how they can use pre-registration to improve the rigor of their own research. So the first one, but, but what if I don't have predictions? I, I know this is exploratory. I'm engaging in exploratory research. And so I don't have a strong sense of a model that I'm going to test and an analysis plan that I'm going to have. That's not a problem. That's an exploratory study. So the implications of that are to call it that. Right now, in the culture of science, we are incentivized to generate narratives after the fact that explain what is actual exploratory results in some sort of narrative flow that provides more confidence than the data actually imply or, or actually indicate. And so if we really are embracing that this particular study is truly exploratory, then the most obvious solution is to not then use hypothesis testing uh, in the analysis, right? I don't know how diagnostic my p-values are gonna be. In fact, I know that they're losing diagnosticity because I don't have an analysis plan in front in, in advance, so don't report p-values. They aren't meaningful information anyway if this is an exploratory analysis, and so I can address that by being very upfront. This is exploratory, and here are my here are my fi descriptive findings that should inspire them. The next study, the next plan, an actual confirmatory test in the future. But there are also other solutions because oftentimes, as soon as you say, "Well, drop p-values," and say, "Well, how then can I make uh, a strong case uh, for my exploratory results?" Well, you can't. <laughs> it's an exploratory finding. Uh, and so this is where sort of some of the mindset that researchers have confronts reality, is that they are embracing this general concept, I'm doing exploratory research, I'm at discovery end, but they want to use the tools for strong inference uh, through confirmatory testing. And those two things don't fit easily. So either we have to embrace that it is exploratory, or we have to find solutions that allow that transition from exploration to confirmation easily. And so one of the solutions, if, uh, if it's possible given the research context, is to have a holdout sample. So I, we've done this a number of times in my lab where we have a new area of research uh, where we are jumping in without a whole much of idea of what it is we're going to find or how it is we even try to understand the phenomenon. So when we do this kind of work, we will collect a large sample and we'll take a portion of that sample for exploratory analysis up front. So we randomly split the data, let's say just split it 50-50, and that initial 50% of data, uh, uh, we do our just jump in and explore, analyze in many different ways, discover what we think are a whole bunch of interesting things, and then we constrain to what are the things that we really want to test now. And we pick out the findings that we think are important findings that we would draw conclusions about. And then we pre-register that. We have a holdout sample that we haven't looked at yet. We've explored with to our heart's content and we've created a model uh, or a set of tests uh, that we want, to, uh, we want to see if they are credible uh, findings. And so if we are willing to commit to those after exploration, then we can apply them to the holdout sample and then use the statistical inferences from the holdout sample as the things that we use to draw conclusions uh, for what it is we observe. Now that's limited if data acquisition is hard, right? If it's very hard to get data, I may not have enough data 
to do a holdout sample. And that's just the reality challenge uh, of having good, good enough power to do research uh, with small samples. Okay, so that's number one. A second, uh, but what the data already exists. How, how can I possibly use pre-registration if we already have uh, the data? And there are many, many, many uh, research applications across disciplines where it, the researcher conducting the analysis isn't the one that generated the data, or they may have generated the data, but they generated it over a long period of time. Uh, and so they don't, it may feel like, how can I possibly pre-register? Not a problem. Of course, it is a problem. All of these are challenges, but I'm, I'm using not a problem to say, let's, we can jump in here. We can do something about this. The, what, the opportunity here is to think about how do we implement the most parts of pre-registration that we want to implement? It, and what's the goal of pre-registration? It's to provide constraint. I want to minimize the flexibility that I have in decision making about how I analyze the data and how I report that data as an outcome. So how do I constrain that given whatever the context of, of looking at having, having that data are? So if the data already exists, then the thing to consider is who has observed it, what have they observed in it, and how, so how much is known about that, and how much of that influences the choices that the analyst uh, will make in, in design analysis plan and then interpreting the results. And as long as, I can transparently report what it is we know and what it is we don't know about that data set. When I am maximizing what it is we can say about the constraints that we were under in drawing inferences and the potential areas of bias or influence that may reduce the overall credibility of that research. So the, the key here from my point of view is what is the comparison? We have, when we talk about pre-registration, we tend to think about the ideal. No, there's, the data don't only exist, you make the commitment, then you get the data and you test against the commitment. That ideal doesn't work for many different research applications. So the correct point of comparison is against the opposite, no pre-registration at all. Is it better to pre-register when the data exists than to not? And the answer is if you want to get to credible inferences, then it is better, and, then the, and how much better depends on how much constraint you can actually apply. And then reporting on that so that the reader, the observer of what it is you've done, can adjust and calibrate their inferences just as you are uh, trying to do the research. Okay. But what if I need to analyze the data to know how to analyze the data? This also happens all the time, right? Those data sets are often hard, and, and we do a lot of our figuring out about how to analyze the data when we're in it. Not a problem. Uh, there are opportunities that we can apply here. Uh, one is blinding the data taking a couple of the columns of the key variables uh, and say that the, each row is an observer, a, a person, say it's human uh, subjects research, each row is a person, and we have the two primary outcome variables. Well, for a, a blinded data set, we randomize those two columns so that the person is no longer associated with their data. And so what I can do then with that data set is it still has the properties of the data set, but I can't evaluate the conclusions. And so I can set up my models, I can look at outliers, I can do all the steps to sort of clean up the data set uh, without then sacrificing the inferences, the quality of the inferences, because my data are randomized. And then once my models are set up and I'm ready, I unblind it, impose back the original structure, and then test my inferences. A second option is called multiverse analysis, where there's lots of potential choices to make about how I analyze my data. And instead of selecting one and committing to that in advance, I commit to what are the different ways in which I could choose to analyze this data. Here are different covariates I could include, here are different exclusion rules I could apply, et cetera, et cetera. And if I lay those out, then I can analyze them all the ways. So instead of committing to a single analysis strategy, I can, I can do a multiverse of all of the potential analysis strategies and then look at the robustness of my findings across those many different choices uh, that I can make. The final strategy that's available is stepwise pre-registration. So I might be in a, a modeling context where I need to create the variables. I need to extract variables from the raw data that then are the variables that are part of the main analysis. And so I, don't, I can't pre-register those variables that are the main analysis because I don't even know what they're going to be yet. I need to extract them from the raw data first. 
So a stepwise pre-registration would involve doing that, committing to that first step, right? Here's how I'm going to analyze the raw data to get to my extracted variables. And then once I have those, then I pre-register the next step of what am I going to do with those extracted variables for inference. And so this incremental pre-registration along the research process tries to identify points where my prior analysis wouldn't influence the choices, wouldn't be influenced by the choices that I can make later so that I can make credible inferences along the way. Okay, uh, but, but what if things change during the study or the analysis, right? I, I make a study plan. I say this is how many people I'm going to have in my study. This is how I'm going to analyze my data. And then once I get into data collection, I realize, oh my gosh, we, we can't collect people that way. We went into these schools. We thought we were going to be able to get 30 classrooms. Turns out we can get 24. Am I sunk? Right? And then once I got into the data, we thought we were going to analyze it this way, but we have this crazy distribution. We can't use that analysis. We have to use a different analysis. Am I sunk? No, it's not a problem. So the goal of pre-registration is to demonstrate what the plans were along the way, not to bind you to decisions that are not the right decisions to make uh, if the circumstances on the ground change. And so the key in this, and in almost it's probably fair to say almost all uh, pre-registrations, things change from what was planned uh, to what was ultimately done uh, at the end. And the key with effective pre-registration is to document it. Report what the changes were along the way and then justify why you made a change from one to the other. So it could be that you say, well, we plan to do this and then we analyzed it. It didn't come out the way we wanted. So we analyzed it a different way. And so that's why we reported that way. Well, that's not going to be a very compelling change to the reader, but it could be more compelling uh, if you say, well, we tried to analyze it this way, but it turns out we had these outliers because the person in the magnet fell asleep, uh, and so they, they didn't respond at all, but we didn't pre-register to remove people that fell asleep. Okay, that's a reasonable change uh, to make as a reader. I don't think that that uh, does anything uh, to sacrifice uh, your statistical inference. But because you can still analyze the data with the person asleep in, at least report that too. And then me as a reader, oh, the effect changed as a function of whether the sleeping person was in or not. Does that change my confidence in the finding? As long as all of that is laid out uh, and available, particularly in supplementary materials, right? You can report additional analyses that were done uh, but are not the main analysis. Then you allow uh, the reader, the, the consumer of that information to make the decisions and, and evaluate your decisions transparently compared to not knowing at all that you made those decisions along the way. All right, uh, last but what if. What if my ideas are so important that I can't register them because everybody would be out there waiting to see what my amazing ideas were uh, so that they can steal them and do them first uh, before I have a chance to. That's also not a problem. Uh, registries like the OSF, uh, not all of them, but some of them offer the ability to embargo. Uh, so it, if you use the OSF for registration, uh, you can set up the registration and set an embargo period of four years so that you get a full head start where your great ideas uh, are registered, uh, but no one gets to see them. They're in there, uh, they're date and time stamp, and they will only become public uh, after you've had sufficient time to actually execute uh, the research. All right, uh, so that's some of the what ifs. Uh, there are also some, okay, I get it, that's interesting, this seems like useful do, but it feels this still feels hard, uh, and so there's a number of additional things that we can think about that might help to improve uh, the likelihood that researchers uh, can uh, proceed with registration with some confidence or at least some willingness uh, to try this out. So some of the examples of this include uh, uh, the, the, the first one, right? Feels like a big lift, right? And it does feel like a big lift for researchers who are new to this. Boy, I have to lay out all these things, and I looked at what the form is, and it seems like a lot. Uh, and I don't know how to anticipate all the things because there aren't a lot of examples of pre-registration in my area. I don't know how to anticipate all the choices uh, that we're going to make in advance. So the answer for this is to think about registration incrementally. Again, we don't need to anchor against the ideal of what pre-registration is and feel like we need to meet every single ideal for it to be a productive pre-registration. Instead, we should be anchoring against current practice. How can we do what we do today a little bit better? And so the way that my lab started with pre-registration in 2012, 
uh, was to take the notes from our meeting, that final meeting we had of planning the study in our lab session, uh, and just take those notes and post them to the OSF and say, that's going to be our registration. And then after we did that, because that's something we did anyway, right? We were already writing some plans. We just write it down uh, and then post that. And then the, once we were analyzing the data, we realized, oh, geez, we, we never even talked about how we would exclude data at that time. Let's do that for the next time. Uh, and then, oh, once we did the next time, oh, we didn't think about this factor. Why don't we include that for the next one? The onset to providing some constraint and additional rigor with pre-registration into a research domain can happen more easily with experience. As people start to step into the process, they learn more about their own research process and how it is they make decisions and which ones can be made effectively uh, in advance and how they can make those decisions. And so an incremental approach just says, just like everything else we do in trying to do the best research we can, there's always room to be better. And so how is it that we can incrementally advance that? The second is this earlier point that things change, right? And things do change. And that shouldn't be a barrier to trying it and saying, oh my gosh, but maybe something will change here. Instead, write down what your plan was in advance because you have some kind of plan in advance and then just document those changes. And doing that will increase the credibility of the claims that you make and help to calibrate for oneself the claims that we make much more uh, than not doing it at all. The, another sort of concern that people say is oh, that this pre-registry registration will hamper me. I will not be able to explore. I have no flexibility if I pre-register my research. And the simple answer is no, no, it doesn't. Uh, pre-registration simply requires that you pre-register what you plan to do in advance, the things that you want to draw strong inferences about with your statistical analysis or otherwise. And then you can do all the exploration and flexible work that you want to after the fact and just call it that. That's all it does. So this one is just a fundamental but pervasive uh, continuing misunderstanding of what the role of pre-registration is. It isn't to value confirmatory research over exploratory research. It's to show you when you're doing one versus the other. Uh, and then the fourth is if you do pre-registration badly, it won't solve the problem. And that is absolutely true. Bad pre-registration will not address the kinds of improvements that we want uh, to see for uh, rigor and reproducibility. Uh, but bad pre-registration in many cases is actually better than no pre-registration at all. Failure to identify exclusion rules, but you did identify the primary outcome, well, at least you identified the primary outcome in advance. And, but simultaneously, it's possible that some kinds of pre-registration will actually not improve at all uh, the way in which uh, the research process identifies true findings or makes progress. And so it is critical that we have a culture that, eva that incorporates evaluation and continuous improvement into the process of pre-registration, its, its application to research domains, and the improvement both on an individual basis and on a cultural basis for any kinds of research process. Okay, so I wanna close with a few minutes of, on information about promoting adoption, and then we'll switch over uh, to questions. I see that a number of questions uh, have been coming in, and so we'll try to address those. So promoting adoption, how is it that we can get people to do this? Well, the good news is that people are starting to do this and, and in increasing numbers. Uh, so the Open Science Framework, OSF, uh, offers the ability to register any kind of research, uh, basic preclinical work. Uh, and you can see on this plot the number of registrations uh, by year since we launched the service in 2012, uh, and it's nonlinear. And what's particularly encouraging about this growth rate is that it's occurring without there being strong policies uh, it, that are broadly adopted to say you have to pre-register. By and large, the adoption of pre-registration in the communities that have adopted it the most uh, is a function of the emergence of it as good practice, as recognition that this is a way for me as a researcher to improve the rigor of my research. And so I'm going to test it out. And then once people test it out, they rarely turn back in my uh, more anecdotal uh, observation uh, that they see once I've done this that, oh, this actually is how I imagined research to be uh, when I was planning to come in, get into science in the first place. And oh, this is actually exciting to have that moment of 
here was our plan, what happened? And oh, this helped me feel free to actually explore my data and not feel like I was doing something wrong in exploration. I can explore my data with abandon, I'm just calling it that. And now I can do that with some additional confidence. And so the emergence of registration as a normative practice has been occurring in advance of some of the stakeholders actually trying to promote it, incentivize it, or require it. So that is a very encouraging sign uh, for adoption of pre-registration as good practice. It isn't in the communities that are adopting it being considered uh, a bureaucratic burden, but rather an opportunity to do better research. The second thing to raise is that NIH has been taking steps uh, to increase uh, the use of pre-registration in research. And in particular, you may be familiar with their moves on uh, NIH clinical trials, which are required by law for clinical, uh, clinical trials in, in any of the typical stages, but which that work, uh, th those requirements are in discussion for extending to preclinical work that is experimental work uh, done on humans. That is still uh, a moving target, as it were. They request some information from the research community for how it is that this could be best implemented and most useful uh, for uh, these domains. Uh, and there's a lot of debate about the relevance of clinicaltrials.gov as a registry service uh, for the kinds of basic and preclinical questions that are used. Uh, but it is very clear that NIH has some commitments to improving uh, rigor and reproducibility in part through the promotion of pre-registration to more domains of research than it has been applied uh, in the past. Uh, and we are, uh, through the center, working with NIH on the possibilities of, for example, having the OSF uh, provide a pipeline of people can register there and meet some of the registration requirements. And I expect that there'll be a lot of work by a variety of communities trying to promote free registration uh, to align with uh, the NIH standards uh, and technologies. Uh, a last example to mention about promoting adoption uh, is, pre is linking pre-registration with publication. And the mechanism for that is this concept of registered reports. You may have heard the term registered reports. You may be very, very familiar with it. Uh, but sometimes people think that registered reports and pre-registration are the same thing. They're two very different things. Everything that I've talked to you so far uh, through this entire session is about pre-registration as part of the research process, regardless of publication, regardless of the journals, no link to journals at all. Registered reports is combining pre-registration with the publication peer review process. And the way that it does so uh, is shown with this uh, cartoon version of how research gets done, right? You design a study, collect and analyze the data, write the report and publish it. In the traditional model, peer review is after the report. All the research is done, and so the peer reviewers evaluate the research that was done and then criticize it on what you should have done uh, to make it publishable. Registered reports makes one change to that process, and it moves peer review to after the design phase. So as an author, I submit to the journal my pre-registered plan. This is my design, how I'm gonna do the study, uh, this is how I'm going to analyze the data, and you uh, evaluate uh, that as the reviewer and editor, evaluate whether that's an important question I'm investigating, whether my methodology is an effective test of that question. And if you agree, that's an important thing to study, we need to know the answer to that, uh, and the methodology uh, meets the threshold of our criteria for quality, uh, then it gets an in-principle acceptance at the journal, go ahead and do the research, and when you do the research, as long as you follow through with everything you said you were going to do, and you do it with quality, uh, then we will publish it at the outset, right? So the goal of registered reports is to reduce publication bias uh, by reducing the influence of whether the results are positive or negative on decisions for publication, because the reviewers at this stage don't know whether the results are positive or negative. And it builds in pre-registration into the review process because I submit my proposal, what I'm going to do, and the reviewers provide feedback on that to how do I improve my registration, my analysis plan, before I actually complete the research. And so it gets the best of both worlds, it gets expert review and advice that can actually be incorporated into improving the research, rather expert review that just says what well, everything that I did wrong after the fact. And once I make that commitment with the journal, of, and they make a commitment to me, that work is pre-registered. Uh, and then will ultimately be published. 
So this offers opportunities for uh, lots of new ways to think about the incentive system for uh, researchers and reasons for them to adopt pre-registration as a mechanism uh, to get publication. So register reports combined those two things. Okay, uh, let me close on the presentation remarks and then we can go to questions uh, with some specific things that funders uh, can do uh, if they're interested in trying to promote pre-registration or evaluate pre-registration in their communities. The first is just raising awareness. It is very clear that there are a number of research domains where the concept of pre-registration is a novelty. Uh, I had a presentation uh, with a group of earth science uh, journals uh, and researchers, uh, and I talked about pre-registration for part of it, and they said, oh, it sounds very interesting. I've never heard of it before. So going from never heard of it before to adopting it as part of standard practice uh, is a lot of steps uh, in between. And so raising awareness by sharing uh, academic papers like the one that I've been referring to, uh, referenced here, uh, and many others uh, that are exploring uh, pre-registration and what its implications are and how it might be translated into practice. Being part of brown bag discussion groups uh, can be an excellent first step uh, for uh, gaining traction in new communities. Funders can also point researchers to guided workflows that have uh, you know, uh, frequently asked questions and then have support for pre-registration along the way. So rather than just having to come up with the concepts whole cloth, they can start with a workflow that guides them step by step for how it is, what it is they could pre-register, and how to do that effectively and, and efficiently. There's also plenty of opportunities for training. Webinars like this, uh, services like other members of our team uh, and others who are gaining expertise in pre-registration to offer it as a service uh, for researchers so that they can learn about and talk about sort of in real time, how is it that we would translate some of these issues into practice? Right? We could spend a whole two hours uh, of a session uh, we're working with a group uh, that works with big data sets that are existing data sets and trying to think about translating some of the principles of pre-registration into how to do that most effectively with that kind of data uh, in, in, in their domain of research. It's also opportunities for addressing pre-registration and policies uh, for, for grantees. So the top guidelines provide that framework uh, and pre-registration of studies to address selective reporting and pre-registration of analysis plans to address uh, questionable research practices are both uh, different, uh, are both uh, items uh, in the top guidelines. A low bar for policy adoption, especially for domains where pre-registration is new, uh, is a level one of pre-registration of studies and analysis plans. All that level one requires is disclosure. Uh, so researchers have to say whether they pre-registered the study or not, and if they have, they have to provide a link uh, to the pre-registration. This is an easy way to raise awareness about pre-registration and to not impose something new on researchers that aren't yet prepared uh, with training or, or understanding of pre-registration for how it's relevant. They just need to say what it is, whether they've done it or not. And if they have to say that, then they might say, well, oh, that's interesting, what is that? How might I think about that? Is that something that applies to my work? There are also uh, organizations like the Lauren John Arnold Foundation that now require pre-registration for all, I think it is all uh, of the research uh, that they fund. And so that is a much stronger uh, stance on the role of pre-registration in improving uh, rigor and reproducibility. And that may be beyond what some uh, foundations are prepared to do yet, but there are some models uh, that people could talk to uh, to find out about how that has uh, worked out in practice. And then I just wanted to mention Templeton World Charity Foundation as another uh, that is pushing innovation in how it is to think about pre-registration and other things around pre-registration to promote uh, rigor and reproducibility. A just announced uh, fun uh, research program in consciousness research by TWCF uh, is incorporating the idea of adversarial collaboration at the front end to design the study. So there are lots of competing theories about consciousness, but the research tends to talk past each other because they design their own experiments, they confirm their own points of view, but rarely find ways to confront the theories against one another. So in their process, they brought the adversarial groups together and had them fight for a couple of days in, the, in a room to come up with studies where their theories make actual different predictions and then design experiments uh, that would test uh, those differences of prediction. 
and then pre-commit uh, to those uh, research designs, and then actually have tests that meet some of these aspirational standards of confronting multiple theories with an experimental test. It's really uh, interesting and, and innovative and worth, uh, worth exploring that uh, as funders for those areas where there are contentious debates about particular claims. Uh, another uh, area to consider is piloting the registered report partnerships with journals. And there are a couple of different uh, communities, uh, funder and journals that have, uh, are piloting this uh, to see if uh, a single process where the reviewers, uh, where the this proposal for the research is reviewed for funding and for publication simultaneously. And so the great outcome for this is that it simplifies potentially the process for authors, right? I get both my funding and my commitment for publication in a single review process. And it increases the likelihood that funded research gets published. There's so many studies that are conduct funded and conducted but never reported at all, no return on investment. Uh, and journals are excited about the potential for getting funded high quality research for their journals. So if you want to explore some of these, there are a couple of examples here uh, that have uh, that are underway, uh, and there's a lot of interest uh, in testing more of those. And then finally, there's opportunities to partner with uh, registries that exist to try to promote uh, registration in one's community, or even to launch registries uh, for a particular research community. Our own service, uh, OSF, we are launching soon in, in early 2019, OSF registries, where communities can run their own service uh, and create their own metadata for what it is should be registered for their kind of research to really try to maximize this opportunity to fine tune how it is registration gets done to maximize its relevance and efficiency for particular research domains. And so that's a, a opportunity as well. Uh, I'll just close here with a slide showing some links to some of the main things uh, that I raised during this discussion. Uh, and then also point out the many members of our team uh, that are highly involved in pre-registration in different uh, roles that they have uh, for uh, implementation of it as policy, of evaluation of it uh, as a research process, of providing uh, training for it, of maximizing uh, its quality uh, and execution across the team of David, Tim, Ian, Courtney, and Alex. Uh, so that is uh, the prepared remarks uh, that I have for this. Uh, we have a number of questions that have come in, uh, and I will just transition to reading uh, those and providing answers to the best that I can. Uh, and just I'll, I'll mark the time here. It is 12.13. Uh, we have uh, East Coast time. Uh, we have 17 minutes uh, for the planned uh, portion of this. Uh, and I'm happy to, to uh, go through as many of these as I can, and you can continue to submit them here. And you can follow up with me or any other person that uh, has their address uh, on this page uh, for questions that you have about how we can help uh, with pre-registration. Uh, so let me go to the Q&A uh, items, uh, and I'll just start uh, at the top. Uh, Brent asked, uh, do you have any data on uptake acceptance of using pre-registration by certain fields? Uh, I showed that graph of overall uh, adoption of pre-registration, how it's accelerating. But this is a very good question because we don't have great insight uh, on how it is being adopted in particular uh, across different disciplines. Uh, we do though know in general about where adoption is strongest. Uh, and uh, it is very, the strongest adoption in sort of basic preclinical work so far is in psychology, particularly in the subfield of social psychology, but expanding to other areas of psychology. There's also, uh, very nice uptake uh, in uh, economics, uh, particularly in uh, development economics or randomized trials that are occurring uh, in the economics community. Uh, but by and large, most of the adoption so far has occurred in sort of, in sort of passing through early adopter and starting to get to mainstream is occurring in the social behavioral sciences uh, across the different subfields. And there are registries, and that's where most of the registries uh, have emerged as well in politics economics and psychology. There is some uh, of it now moving out uh, into the life sciences in particular, uh, like in ecology and evolutionary biology as the most prominent sort of transition discipline, as well as neuroscience uh, in moving into those fields. But adoption rates aren't yet as high 
but that's where the very interesting growth areas uh, are that are emerging. Uh, but there's a lot more to study there about where it is, uh, uh, where it is happening, and then how best to facilitate it to new domains. Uh, another question, do you think there's room for pre-registration in students' projects? Is there existing infrastructure for pre-registration for master's, apprenticeships, theses, and dissertations? That's a great question. Uh, the, the, I think pre-registration actually feels quite natural for students as they're getting into the research process, because a lot of how we describe the scientific process as people get into it is in its idealized form. You generate an idea, you come up with a way to test that idea, you collect some data, you evaluate it against what you thought was going to happen, and then you share what you learned with others. That idealized model of how we describe the scientific process, even to fourth graders, my daughter uh, has that just came home in, in her, uh, her assignment of how it is science works. Uh, that process essentially builds in pre-registration and how it's described. So I think there's lots of opportunity in terms of instructional focus for building pre-registration into student research. In practice, it's very easy to build it in because there are a number of uh, registries that exist that welcome any kind of research, uh, and it doesn't whether it's student research or otherwise. Uh, so, for example, on the OSF, you can select different from different uh, registration metadata formats from very sort of simple. Uh, to do, not very comprehensive, but easy, uh, to very comprehensive, but more complex. And so one can select from these different ways that you can register research that match up with student projects or otherwise, and then just identify them as such. So that's a, a great question. Uh, next question, let's see. Uh, does clinicaltrials.gov uh, or COS allow pre-registration of observational studies? The answer is yes to both. Uh, so clinicaltrials.gov has, uh, over its, uh, its existed since 1991, I believe, and over its history uh, has about 20,000, I think, uh, or maybe it was 10,000, uh, 10,000 studies uh, that are observational or basic research described. Uh, so they have the facility to do that. Uh, and while the rates aren't high at clinicaltrials.gov because it uh, is perceived by some as burdensome for that kind of research, nevertheless, it has been used for that. Uh, and also, the OSF is wide open for observational studies. So that's a, a perfect, uh, perfectly reasonable use case there. Uh, <clears throat> another question Salvatore asks, what is the appetite of high-impact journals to publish experimental studies in a pre-registered research model? And how about the confidentiality of labs that do not want to share with everyone what their plan is? Okay, that was probably asked right before. Uh, I uh, mentioned that you can embargo registrations on some registries so it stays private uh, in advance. However, that may be also asking about uh, in the review process, the research, the reviewers will inevitably know uh, what the researchers are planning uh, because they're getting peer reviewed for it. Now that, that particular issue is the same issue that occurs in the grant review process. So reviewers of grants have opportunity to see what the plans are uh, for other researchers in their community. And there are strong norms and standards about the confidentiality of that process, and those should apply uh, equally uh, to the review of pre-registrations, uh, which in many cases are very similar uh, to what's actually proposed in a grant proposal process. Uh, but nevertheless, that is something to take very seriously, particularly if you as a funder uh, are trying to incorporate this uh, into a review process or in a partnership with journals is making very clear what the normative expectations are so that reviewers have no illusion that if they are willing to try to steal an idea from someone else's work that they observe, that they are doing that in a way that is counter to norms and even to policy uh, and will be uh, addressed, uh, addressed with that in mind if they are caught for doing so. Uh, in terms of high impact journals' uh, interest in publishing this, there is, uh, for pre registration, there certainly is uh, high willingness to publish pre registered research among the editors that we engage with of high impact journals. What is still an area of reluctance uh, among journals, which is similar uh, among funders, uh, is the uh, decision to require pre registration for publication. And that is a very reasonable. Uh, uh, concern at this stage, particularly because there isn't 
across the wide range of uh, research uh, types that, that journals, uh, especially high impact journals publish, requiring re registration at this stage would be a big lift and introduce a lot of chaos <laughs> uh, while people say, I don't even know what that is. How can you be requiring that of me at the onset of my research in, in order to do it effectively? And simultaneously, because research is new, uh, pre registration is new in a variety of research domains, it isn't yet perfectly clear how it translates effectively into practice in some domains. So, for example, I did a session uh, a number of months ago with the um, uh, American Chemical Society, and the editors there were quite interested in the concept of pre registration. And what we puzzled with in a lot of discussions is how is it that it would translate into practice in some of the kinds of research that they publish, right? particularly in domains where really it's a descriptive uh, research. They are sh saying, showing, can we actually create uh, this kind of compound? Does pre-registration actually apply uh, in that? And there are certain domains of research that are, are knowledge advancing, but aren't hypothesis driven even in an exploratory sense, uh, where pre-registration may not be a, a useful tool or useful as uh, conceived. So there's a lot of things uh, to still explore in the research community about how this gets translated into practice. So imposing as a requirement uh, requires uh, pretty clear knowledge about how it is that the registration occurs in that kind of research. And so mostly, I think, adoption by high-impact journals and by funders will start with pilots uh, on let's try this out uh, and with domains where it is pretty clearly laid out uh, and with incentives like it'd be great if you tried this in these new domains in order to see how far it could go. Okay, thanks for the, that question. Uh, another question, is there a listing of all of the registration sites that can be used and which are the best for different disciplines? I don't think there is a formal listing of that, and that would be a good thing for us to post uh, on our uh, website somewhere or, uh, or more generally. Uh, there aren't very many outside of clinical trials. So there uh, are a number of clinical trials. There's clinicaltrials.gov uh, that applies for any research, but particularly for the US context. And then there are uh, sister clinical trials uh, registries uh, in a number of different uh, global regions. And so that's the main collection of registries that exist that are focused on uh, clinical trials work. For basic and preclinical work, uh, the most popular registries that exist right now are the OSF is one. Uh, the uh, AEA, American Economic Association, offers a registry called Social Sciences Registry. Uh, and that's particularly useful for RCTs uh, in economics, but I think they accept uh, other kinds of research. EGAP. Uh, offers a registry uh, in, uh, re related to research in politics, uh, and then RIDE uh, offers a registry, R-I-D-I-E. -D we'll send a, afterwards, we'll, we'll send some links uh, with all the registries uh, that we are, are aware of uh, that can be used for research. Oh, and I should mention that uh, SRI, uh, in Education Research, uh, just launched a new registry uh, in, uh, in, uh, at the end of October uh, for uh, randomized trials in education and case study research. Uh, another question, can you provide a link to your pre-registration on your application if you would like to? Uh, yes, that certainly is uh, the case for, uh, it, it's very easy to provide a link just like it's easy to provide links to other supplementary materials and other things. Uh, and so to the extent that researchers are already adopting pre-registration, uh, it's very easy, and, and often if they're doing it, they want to say that they're doing it because they believe it in good practice uh, to share that in their application materials and otherwise. Uh, the last question I have here is, do you see that there is a growing expectation from publishers or journals for pre-registration? And we cover that sort of in general terms uh, in the answer one of the last questions. Uh, but I think the, the specific answer here is yes. Uh, and incrementally. Uh, so as we we're describing, imposing a strong standard of requirement across the board uh, is unusual unless their funder or the journal is in a domain where it's clear how that could be done. And so two examples where it's been imposed as a requirement. 
Lauren John Arnold Foundation requires it for uh, the research that they fund. The kinds of research questions that they fund are ones that are very amenable uh, to pre-registration uh, in the kind in the research domains they have: education, social policy evaluation, uh, social science, uh, or behavioral science kinds of research applications. So there is lat there's ability to sort of present that uh, as a expectation, and uh, even though in those domains lots of researchers aren't yet familiar with it, they have tools and facilities to become relatively familiar. Uh, in order to do the research, and so they're, they're, the, the, that facilitates the overall adoption. On the journal side, there is one journal that I know of uh, outside of clinical uh, research uh, that requires pre-registration, and that is uh, the journal is called CRSP, Comprehensive Results in Social Psychology, and that uh, journal is a registered reports only journal. So they do not accept research that's already been conducted. You have to send a proposal of the experiment or experiments that you're going to conduct, and that goes through peer review at the journal. Once they agree to publish it, it's pre-registered commitment. This is what you're going to do. This is how you're going to analyze the data, and then they publish the outcomes of that. And they only accept that kind of research. It's a very exciting uh, experiment, and they've been having uh, nice success uh, in gaining adoption uh, and submissions for that uh, process. Uh, but they also have the advantage uh, of that's the area that's been most active in pre-registration. So there's already a community of interest. <clears throat> so I think most of what will happen uh, in the near future is <clears throat> adoption uh, incrementally by pilots uh, and tests and disclosure. Okay, I think that takes uh, all of the questions that have come up uh, and we are just about at time. So I think we're gonna end right on time. Uh, so let me close in thanking you for making time for this session. Uh, let me thank the uh, lords of the internet for not having this break uh, and whatever it is uh, happened that allowed my kids to not uh, come in at the end. Uh, of course, I have to go check that they're alive. Uh, so many thanks to you uh, and please follow up with us if you have any questions, follow up questions or things that you would like to do. Uh, in collaboration. We're delighted uh, to have this interest in pre-registration. We'll be delighted to support anything that you would like to do to try to advance it in your research communities. Thank you very much.